when I republished the story because I wanted to facilitate the reader being carried along one path without necessarily coming back to a chapter that they'd already read. Um, and then moving on to game books, the plots get quite a lot more complicated. Um, that gives you an idea, that's an extract of uh, one of the game book adventures. Um, that's a computer generated play chart, not necessarily one that's done for the point of view of being able to interpret it, but it gives you an idea of just how complicated uh, the, the plot lines can become. Uh, beyond plot, you also need to think about characters, and I suppose they're the three main things that you would think about, or I would think about when designing your characters. You need to work out, okay, who's the, the protagonist, who's the main character of your story, or main characters, um, who's the antagonist, who are the characters uh, creating the conflict in the story, because essentially all stories need some sort of conflict in order for there to be events, for things to happen. If it's a, a nandy pandy peaceful world where nothing happens, there's not really any story. Um, beyond that, you also got the other characters. And for each of them, you need to think about why they're interesting, what makes those characters unique and distinctive. You also need to think about the setting of the story, of course. Um, and the setting, in many ways, leads into the following questions. So, if it's, say, a fantasy world, that also to define um, who your readers are, what sort of market you're going for. Um, and tied into that even is what sort of impact you're wanting to have on your readers. If it's, if it's say, a, a fast-paced story or a story where um, there's a lot of action, you, you want it to have an impact on the reader that says, you know, they're riveted by the story. It might be something more philosophical, it could be something more intense or emotional. There's a range of different effects and that really does affect how you want to structure your story and how you deliver it. Um, and that of course ties into how ultimately you would sum up a book. Um, which you get a lot of practice with as people ask you when you're writing a story what it's about and you're essentially thinking of a, a one sentence answer that basically says what the book's about. Um, which leads on to the final uh, questions. Um, is it compelling? Is it something that the reader is going to want to keep reading? Can't remember the order of these. Okay. Um, how easily can the, the reader follow the story? Um, if it's not a logical story flow, if they're going to get confused and not really know what's going on, then obviously you're going to lose the reader. Um, Similarly, on the, just on the point about being compelling, it needs to, you know, not only have a good start to hook them in, but it needs to maintain their interest. Um, I think one mistake that some readers do make is they focus too much on creating the world and describing the world when they really haven't got the investment from that reader at that point in time. If they're bored with details, they're not going to bother to continue reading into the story. So that's why I would leave the story first and then gradually introduce the elements of the world as you've got that investment from the reader that they want to keep creating the story. Um, also making the characters believable, given the setting. Um, obviously if it's a fantasy world and you've got some character that casts spells or something, that's, that's going to be believable in the context of that world. But the characters themselves, are they realistic? Do they react in a way that the reader would think that it, it makes sense? Um, is the conclusion satisfying? Um, the way it all wraps up, is there a sense of closure? Um, and if you wanted to have sequels and that sort of thing, you know, you can always leave that open, but it in itself, it needs to not seem rushed and be satisfying for the reader that, you know, they're happy with the story that they've bought money for. Um, and is it too predictable ties into that? Um, obviously, if they know the story halfway through or how it's going to end, they sort of they could uh, feel like they haven't really got what they wanted. Um, they haven't really got something out of it that challenged them and surprised them. Um, and finally, do you actually like the story? And that's really important because ultimately, if you don't like the story, then you probably um, 
It's going to show in how you, how you write it, it's not going to show the passion, and it's probably going to be obvious to the reader as well. So, I mean, ultimately, you need to follow your own vision and your own goals of what you want to achieve from the book. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dean Taylor. Dean has been working in animation since um, before some of you were born. Or before, uh, I don't know if you were allowed to mention that or point that out. Um, no, no, well, yes, no, fine. You can go to the day over 21. Um, he's worked on as a production designer, writer, director on everything from Popeye to the Flintstones to uh, Smurfs, Ren and Stimpy, Yakety Yak. Uh, most notably, he has worked uh, as the art director on the Oscar nominated Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas and uh, is currently, amongst other things, working on the development of an animated feature with Monty Python's Kerry Jones called Adam the Serpent and Eve. And I saw um, Lost in La Mancha recently. Um, uh, that's the wrong Monty Python person, isn't it? So they, no, it's nowhere near as good. Dean's here to tell us about what he does and how that might apply to what you're doing. Yeah, thank you. That was a lot of good points in Andrew's uh, talk. I thought what, what I got from all that too was the fact that however complex the process needs to be, it's still that simple idea underneath it that's going to shine through, especially for you if you're creating. I come from a slightly different perspective. I started in animation in 1978 and I started to work on uh, series, uh, series television animation for Hanna Barbera in Sydney. At that time, we were producing that studio about half an hour of television every week, so 2,000 feet amongst about 150 animators or 150 crews, which was actually kind of a very tight schedule. But, uh, some of you may know the complexities of producing that kind of work. But essentially, everyone's working 12 to 15 hours a day, six, seven days a week. What comes out of that is whether you're in layout or the animation what comes out of it is the, the ability to learn by trial, it's trial by fire, just to get to produce so much work that you can't help but learn shortcuts and economical storytelling. I was in layout. I chose that area because I felt it involved staging, set design, choreography, camera, all that. I didn't have a clue at that time it was the hardest part of the process. So what I, what I did at that time was I decided to move into the studio and I did for three months so that as my work left my desk, I could comfortably move around the studio through the night and see what the animator did with it, what the background person did, etc., etc., which was a little hard to do through the day, but I got busy and conscious of the majority of work. Um, so that was three months block kind of set me up for knowing process of storyboards for the final production. I stayed there for until 86 and um, continued with, under the guidance of Dill Hanna, uh, going to various studios around the world helping with other productions. So by the time I left Hanna Barbera, I produced about 400 hours of television, which was just a great learning experience. It's all rubbish. But <laughs> Thank you. 